Okay, good morning everyone and welcome to workshop D for the Australian Citizen Science Association Conference, SITSIOS 21. Today our workshop is on how to keep a nature journal and why it is important. Our co-hosts co are Dion, Dion Dior and Julia Langford from Nature Art Lab. I'm going to hand over to Dion and Julia, but um, I should have introduced myself, sorry. I'm Amy Slocum, the National Coordinator of AXA, and my partner in crime over there is Bill Flynn, who is our technical assistant today with the Zoom. So hope it goes well. Enjoy everyone, and over to you, Dion and Julia. Thank you very much, and, um, and welcome everybody. Today we're delighted to present a, um, a very special session on nature journaling, which is something that everyone can be involved in and, and is so important for citizen scientists. Um, we're going to start with, uh, my name is Julia Lanford, I'm the founding director of Nature Art Lab, and I'm going to um, co-host or co-host um, this session with Dion. Dion, would you like to introduce yourself as well? Hi everybody, yes, welcome. Um, it's wonderful to have you all here and it's, it, it, it's especially exciting that um, ASCA has um, embraced the whole nature journaling um, paradigm. I think it's very, very important. It's certainly proven to be a very powerful mechanism for citizen science um, both project-wise and the encouragement of participants. So I'm a um, natural science illustrator and a field, specialising in field illustration and journaling, and I'm also um, a natural science communicator. And I'm working with Julia with Nature Art Lab, um, which is really doing some wonderful things in this area. So welcome and thank you for joining us. Um, I hope you get something out of this workshop. Um, yeah, so will we get started, Julia? Yes, let's do that. And so for a start, we've got a really lovely video just to introduce Nature Art Lab and what we're doing. Um, so we'll, we'll present the, a short two minute video and then we'll start our, um, our um, presentation. Hi, I'm Julia Lanford, the founding director of Nature Art Lab. Nature Art Lab is the leading natural science, art and scientific illustration organisation in Australia. Through our high quality classes, environmental advocacy and citizen science involvement, we offer a new way of engaging communities in art and science in Australia and around the world. Nature Art Lab studios can be found in Canberra and Noosa, as well as online for students from all over Australia and internationally. We offer exciting art, science and photography courses and workshops inspired by nature in a caring, inclusive and creative environment. We also offer specialised nature tours to biodiverse locations in Australia, Borneo, Costa Rica and even the Galapagos, Ecuador and Peru. Observe the world in a different way with others who have shared interests and environmental values through our local communities. Connect with nature and art and improve mindfulness, enhance cognitive ability, catalyze creativity and support better mental health and well-being. One of our key programs is nature journaling, which represents a new way of experiencing and exploring nature. Nature journaling promotes mindfulness, focuses the mind and creates strong connections with nature. It helps us to use all of our senses to understand the natural environment around us, from the micro to the macro, especially for citizen scientists. Nature journaling plays an important role in documenting observations and natural phenomena in a rapidly changing world. There's nothing like a walk in nature to calm the mind and remind us that the world is a wonderful place. Slow down, pay attention, and connect more deeply with our natural surroundings. Nature Art Lab supports citizen science engagement through our many specialised programs, including nature journaling.
Thank you. And um, so now we'll start our presentation and um, we'll put up the, we'll start with the, the first couple of slides. I'm just going to admit another person then. Okay. Can everybody see that? Yeah, that's good, Dion. Okay. Okay. Oh, Julia, I think uh, it's over to you. All right, thank you. So today's presentation, we're going to talk a little bit about why nature is so vital to our well-being. We're also going to have a look at um, at why what a nature journal is and what does it, what it involves in terms of materials and um, and ways of observing. Journaling as a group, we're going to have a live demo and group practice session. And also we're going to talk a bit about the importance of nature journaling to citizen science participation. And there will obviously be some time for questions at the end as well. So let's start with the next slide, which is talking about the benefits of nature journaling. With nature journaling, we can become much more present through nature art and connect deeply with our natural surroundings. And one of the very important things about this is experiencing mindfulness, which is actually learning to exclude a lot of other distractions from our lives and focus just on what we're looking at in front of us. Um, I think um, one of the key things about that is slowing down, paying attention to what we're seeing in nature and experiencing the natural world. Through this, we can also develop our creativity and critical thinking skills, being curious and asking lots of questions about what we're seeing or what we're looking at. And all of this supports a growth mindset and actually helps us to learn a lot more about what we're looking at and what we're experiencing in the natural world. So being a naturalist and being a nature journal is all about being curious, paying attention, noticing things, having a sense of wonder about what we're looking at and experiencing in the, in the natural setting and spending more time outdoors, using all of our senses. So thinking about touch, so sense of smell, listening to the sounds of wildlife around us, looking at things and, and even tasting things where it's appropriate. Um, it's about exploring our natural surroundings and being creative in the way that we're, we're understanding and, and, um, and relating to things. And also being able to tell your story through nature journaling. And this little image on the right-hand side here is one of my nature journals, which was um, tells a story about a little caterpillar that we found in our garden. And this little caterpillar was um, living on eucalypt leaves but we found it ready to pupate. And so we picked it up and, um, and put it into a little container of soil. Um, this particular species likes to burrow into the ground to pupate. And so we watch that process happening and this nature journaling records the way that the caterpillar looked, some notes about its behavior, some notes about the the, um, the pupil um, process and the way that that transformation happened. And then it was about 20 days later that the moth emerged and, we, and then was able to draw the beautiful moth that emerged, which was the pink bellied moth. And so nature journaling can be an incredible experience to actually absorb, observe and understand the natural processes that we're seeing around us. And that little record there is actually really important for citizen science and ensuring that we have the opportunity to learn more about what we're seeing and the way that we're recording and, and creating these memories of natural species and natural phenomenon in the field. And this is another little example here of two pages from my nature journal as well. And in this example, we're looking at a native species, which is the one on the left of the, um, the, um, the Cranesbill um, plants. And the introduced species is the drawing on the right. So we've got, um, and through this nature journaling process, I was able to map 
the length of each of the segments of the plants that we were looking at. So the one on the left, you can see that those segments were much shorter and much, um, and the leaves were slightly different shape. The length of the seed was slightly different. And so noting all of those attributes in a nature journal is a really wonderful way to understand, compare and contrast different species in the field and really get to know them. Um, so for this example, I was using colored pencils and ink pens and, um, and graphite pencils in, an, in an, um, a nature journal or a visual art diary. And this is something that everyone can do, but it's such a wonderful experience to actually really focus on that species and, um, and keep those records and that documentation of your, um, of your learning experience. So what exactly is a nature journal? And I'm going to hand over to Dion now to present the next slide. Okay, so for most of us who don't, or, or for those of you who don't keep any kind of um, written record, this will be fairly new. But for those of you, particularly the scientists amongst us, um, a nature journal is goes by many names. And I think in the traditional sense, it is known as a field journal. In, a, in an older sense, it's known as the explorer's sketchbook. Um, it is a scientific record. And it's a naturalist's notebook and every permeation of written um, and illustrated records of time in nature um, is considered nature journaling. Um, it's a tool that's used by everybody who's working in this field and everybody who's interested in this field in a profound way. And we're discovering it's a tool that is becoming more and more important to everyday people who want to record their time in nature. Um, importantly, scientists already have a version that they're mandated to use. Um, it's predominantly data and very word and number and data driven. Researchers, naturalists, all are required by their professions to keep journals of some kind. Um, and importantly now, nature lovers have I think flocked to the idea of a nature journal because it's a way for them to record and recall all of those magnificent and mundane moments that they have in nature. Um, I think with the onset of technology, our, our time in nature has become very rough and very rushed and um, often forgotten, unmemorable. So the, um, the journals themselves, whatever form they take, and that depends on the person and the purpose, it uses words, data, um, narratives, sketches, maps, and everything in between. And the idea of it is to record observations, to describe our experiences that we've had in nature, um, to illustrate the specimens that we find, either small or large. Um, importantly, it's to explore ideas, ask questions, follow leads um, and obviously to collect data. And I think that some people ask why, why do we need to do all this? You don't need to do it, but to have a record of that has proven to be profoundly important um, and often by serendipity to the natural science community. Okay, so what's the big deal about a nature journal? Um, it's a very big deal. It's a global phenomenon and it's, it seems to be becoming a very powerful tool in all areas of um, both natural science, naturalist exploration and just personal journeys. Most of you will know that we can't do science and even and especially citizen science without a detailed journal of some kind that contains observations and interpretations. Um, quite often they're digital, but we're finding that the digital records are getting lost to data. Um, the process of keeping a nature journal, it's the process itself that is profoundly different from taking a photo. It's about sharpening observation and without sharp, solid, focused observation, we miss so much. Um, it infuses the experiences that we have in nature with permanence and accuracy. Nothing implants um, an experience of a natural finding like 
actually sitting down and recording it either through words or some kind of data or more importantly through the idea of a drawing or an illustration of some kind. And that permanence and accuracy of memory helps connect us very, very deeply with nature. And at the end of the day, a deep connection to nature means a, an important advocate of nature. And the one thing we're finding, especially now that nature journaling seems to have really become a juggernaut of, in the last couple of years, is that it creates a legacy of our personal observations and discoveries in nature um, and our collective um, observations and discoveries. And it becomes a record, an important record for the communication of natural science, um, both understanding and awareness. Photographic um, visuals are available to everybody, but so many important ones are getting lost in the moment or getting lost in the data. It seems that illustrations tend to stop people in their tracks. A written account of one's experience in nature stops the viewer in their tracks and they take notice of what's on the page and what's going on. Um, and that's certainly been my experience. Um, so as I've said, citizen science and nature journaling plays a very, very important role in understanding natural phenomena. With good records and as accurate as possible visual interpretations of what we're finding and seeing and experiencing in nature, we're able to understand either by purpose or by um, accident some very important natural phenomena. Um, and there is certainly through my journals, and I know Julia has had a lot of aha moments with her journals, when you build the record and the journals become consistent and available, you start to see some really, really important elements relating to things like climate change variations, changes in biodiversity and our ability to map those changes, um, symbiotic relationships and how I think exotic and natural are becoming blurred in their importance to symbiosis um, and certainly seasonal trends and phenology and I think with Australia's very important and profound ability to embrace our First Nations and Indigenous um, citizens, those understanding Australia's unique seasonal trends and phenology through the eyes of our Indigenous populations is extremely important, extremely important, I think, to understanding the uniqueness of this country. Um, so what does it involve? Well, Julia has touched on this already. Um, and first and foremost, it's about observation. And I think that observation ties very importantly back to citizen science. Because with our citizen science projects and participation, we're asking the citizen science to observe and report. And those who develop a greater observation capability can find and report on a much bigger scale, a much more important scale for citizen science research. And so nature journaling is the foundation. It's in my mind, one of the most important tools for the practice and refinement of observation skills, because it is about choosing to notice certain things around us, especially when others don't, when we're, we're tramping through the bush, you know, looking at birds to actually sit down and try and purposefully write about or draw our bird experiences delivers us so much more information than if we're just staring at it through the binoculars and then moving on. So it's about paying conscious attention and developing a conscious awareness. So observation through consciousness will make all of our citizen science projects just far more effective, I think. So with the process, we stop, we look, we listen to what's going on around us, we smell, we touch, it's the five senses and our ability to purposefully use those five senses to describe our observations in nature. Um, and field scientists among us right now will be saying, yeah, that's what we do, that's what we've been doing forever, and, I, and that's true. And that's, that's an important component that we wanna pass on to the citizen participants in our projects because it makes their contribution much more profound. 
Um, what we tend to do and certainly what I encourage with the, the groups I lead and the classes I teach is about saying out loud what we call speak the obvious. So it's about saying out loud observations. It's about working with each other verbally to follow curiosity, to describe to each other what we're seeing. And then we pick up our journals and we start writing or drawing or measuring and recording. We paste, we count, we do whatever we need to do in order to capture all of the information we possibly can about what we're experiencing in nature. Um, we don't have to have the answers to those questions. We don't have to know the species that we're looking at. That's part of what the Nature Journal gives us, a record of what we're looking at. And we use the, what we call the classic laws prompts, and he's considered, John Muir Laws is considered one of you know, the eminent Nature Journaling advocates in the world. And he's a, an author of some wonderful books in Nature Journaling, and he... He introduced us to the idea of answering these prompts as we go along. I notice, I notice that this, the leaves on this tree are all filled with holes. I notice that this insect has, has an unusual coloration in its wings. I notice this, this, this. I wonder, prompts us to ask the question, I wonder why that's the case. I wonder what put these holes in this the leaves on this tree. I wonder why this bird is making so much noise when it's not apparent there's a mate around and so on and so forth. It reminds me of, it reminds me of another moth I saw or it reminds me of something I have experienced or read about or any number of things. And then the one that I've added myself, which I, I think is important for my students is I need to. I need to find out what this means. I need to I get a confirmation identification. I need to talk to somebody who knows this. I need to take a sample or whatever you need to do to continue that path of curiosity as we move through the nature journey. Um, so, you know, I think looking at that, we start by looking at the big picture in nature journaling and in citizen science projects that I get involved with, the first thing I do is look at the big picture. And with the recent backyard bird count, when we were working in the backyard, first thing we did was describe and document what the backyard looks like. Um, so taking notice of the big picture. And there's a wonderful author, I'm not sure if any of you have heard of him, Tristan Gooley. He, he's got a series of books. Um, and he, he says that there are only three, there are three groups of people who dominate the ability to see and observe nature in powerful and profound ways, far more than anyone else. And he said the first one of those would be indigenous communities of various countries. So in Australia, the First Nations people and their abilities, their ancient abilities to track and connect to the land, they see things that we don't see. The second group is considered elite military. So highly trained individuals like SAS and Marines or you know SEAL teams or whoever they are who spend a lot of time outside and they have they understand and they're very highly trained to see the environment in ways we don't and the third group he's identified is artists artists who particularly work in nature and and i like to put at the top of that list nature journalists um, who stop and see the environment in ways that most people don't because we take the time to look and so he's introduced us to his method for in evaluating and scanning an environment for clues, for signs, for understanding. And he uses this sort of method. And we use this a lot um, in our classes and, and tours. And that is um, the shape of the landscape. We describe it. We observe it. The overall character, routes, tracks, edges, edges of the landscape that we're looking at, which indicate things like beaches, paths, um, fence lines, and so forth. And then the details. So we then start to dig into things like foliage type soils and grasses. Um, and then the second step, of course, is then we, we dig into looking at the details. So observing small things, you know, what are plants, insects, fungi, birds, any other Anything else we're looking at in terms of, you know, species or purpose, particularly with citizen science, 
um, we then apply our curiosity and patience and we take note of, you know, trees, insects, birds, fungi, and all of the elements pertaining to that. So just to touch on again, the things that we include in our journal and there's no prescription for nature journaling. What's important is there are processes that different individuals embrace and that are importantly morphable for projects, particularly specific citizen science projects, you know, depending on the objective, the journals will reflect that objective. Um, so things, we, we, we talk lists, counting, estimating, measuring, mapping, we do it all, sketching, painting, charting, describing. Um, then we ask the questions, we dig into metadata, research, hypothesis, narration, diagrams, illustrations, all of these elements. Um, and so we see nature journaling is, we say it's the key tool of citizen science participation, but it's probably a tool um, and the way to become efficient naturalist and contributor to the projects um, is the noticing and the reporting. Very, very important. So uh, applying all of that to projects, um, this just gives you a little sequence of how we do it and it changes depending on what we're doing. So we observe and we observe very closely magnifying glasses, microscopes, you know, when we're doing field work, it's whatever we can carry into the field. Um, we then spend time studying those subjects. This is where we take measurements. This is where we identify components. If we can, we look at behaviours. This giant grasshopper wasn't going to sit still, so we had to be put in a little bottle so I could look at him. Then the field journal itself looks something like that on the screen, which is a very quick and rough ability to take lots of notes, scribble some sketches, take measurements, record whatever we can record. Um, and one of the elements that I think is very important to the field journaling is the story that you're telling about that experience. And I encourage my students to speak in first person. So I am here in the forest. I have come across this magnificent giant Australian grasshopper its coloration is this, blah, blah, blah. And then the story tells. And with this particular grasshopper, it jumped out at me and scared the living Harry out of me. So it was quite funny. I journaled and observed, we then release. We, we generally don't collect unless there's a specific, um, either a license or an individual trained to collect, especially with insects. Um, we release as much as possible. We leave no trace. Um, we don't take anything because everything that we've experienced goes into our journals. Um, and then we take back with us, and amongst these is a series of photographs. We take a lot of photographs, but we take those back. And if we have some sort of a purpose, like an illustration of some sort or some kind of um, more refined record that we want to present to the science leader or another group or for science communication, then we work on the illustrations, usually back in the studio. But we have all the information we need while we've been in the field. And that's the important thing because it's first person experience that is recorded in the moment. Um, and that's irreplaceable because memory is fickle and we often forget it. So this brings me to the point that once upon a time, there wasn't a explorer, a scientist, a naturalist, um, a person who was interested on the planet who didn't keep a detailed and profoundly beautiful nature journal. Um, we don't do it anymore. It's not, it's not mainstream, but hopefully it's becoming mainstream because Museums, as we know, are filled with magnificent journals of explorers and scientists from generations gone by. And, and most of these journals are things that they've been the foundation to everything we know about the natural world today. Either rightly or wrongly, we've either been able to prove or disprove the things that we've, these people have included in their journals. And these journals didn't just include data they included their stories, they included their experiences. And we know now how important that part of nature journaling has been and is to our understanding of how these people traveled the world and what they experienced. 
Um, and sadly, since the onset of mobile technology, um, there is a huge gap now in the tangible illustrated field journals of this new generation. There's nothing, there's no records. We can go to a museum and we can see these beautiful sketchbooks and journals of explorers before us. We can't do it of the modern generation. Most people either keep it to themselves or they don't keep these kinds of records anymore. The only records we have are digital, so photographic, which is great. There's no doubt about that. And as nature journalists, we contribute to the photographic database as much as anybody else. But all of the other components are lost. And so it's our mission at Nature Art Lab to try and reignite that amongst both the scientific and the naturalist communities, and importantly, the citizens who are involved in these projects. Um, so just an example of how important some of these journals have been, um, Ed Hillary, as most of you know, Sir Edmund Hillary, he was obviously a New Zealand mountain climber. He was an Arctic explorer. And along with the Tibetan mountaineer Tenzing Norgay, uh, on the morning of May 29th, was the first person to reach the summit of Mount Everest. Well, he kept detailed journals um, right throughout his explorations, his preliminary explorations and his post explorations. And it's through those journals that we were able to understand some of the challenges faced by the first ascent of Mount Everest. Uh, Henry Walter Bates, this is a favourite of Julia's. Um, he's an English naturalist and explorer, and he gave the first scientific account through his journals of mimicry, of insect mimicry. Um, and he was very famous for his exploration of the Amazon rainforests. And it was through his journals that we actually understood more about insects and insect mimicry than we have in any other way. Jan Brandis, um, he a, was a, not a naturalist necessarily, certainly not a scientist. He was a Lutheran minister um, in Bat Batavia, and he's, which was where the East, East India, the Dutch East India um, Company was headquartered in Asia. And he was a prolific field journaler. Uh, and he produced extraordinary visuals in his journal. It was just a hobby. And his mandate was to just capture absolutely everything he could, anything of interest. And the most astonishing part of it now is that his illustrations in his journals are as vivid and fresh um, and as extraordinarily important to science as they were the day he did them. Um, and those books are there for us to see. Of course, one of the most well-known is Diane Fossey uh, and her explorations of the, the, the Rwanda gorillas. I'm getting all a bit tongue-tied now. Um, you know, she was a paleontologist and she was a conservationist and obviously she was murdered in her tent in Rwanda. Um, she had challenges with poachers along the way, but she was the first person to deeply document the behaviours of the Rwandan gorillas. Um, and her journals, as you can see here, her journals, which helped us identify that unique gorillas can be identified through their nose prints, which is similar to a fingerprint for people like us. Um, she also documented in her nature journals or her field journals, things about location and life at camp. And so they became really, it was a very detailed record of her experiences in the field. And all of her journals became a foundation to the movie Gorillas in the Mist and the gorilla.org foundation now, gorillafund.com. And finally, Gillian Prance, who is still a very well-known botanist, um, a very celebrated botanist and ecologist in the world. And he's one of the seminal scientific explorers of the Amazon rainforest. And he basically said that notebooks are an essential part of his exploring kit. And of course, he has all sorts of other things. But in terms of making a genuine contribution to knowledge, careful marks made in a journal are the things that outlive us. And that's what we're finding a lot of people like to do. They produce their stories in these journals because they outlive us and they outlive us all. Uh, and here's just some recent examples. Of, of some journals and some journaling. Um, Julia, did you want to add anything before we move on to the last, to the next phase? Um, 
look, that's, yeah, that's really a really good um, comprehensive set of examples. And the other person I would mention are people like Albert Einstein, who was also a very famous scientist who used nature, who used um, drawing and documentation to, um, to illustrate what he was observing and what he was looking at. Um, and, you know, there are very many famous people who've done this throughout their, their careers. Um, and it's, it's really clear that the drawing and observation helps to form those scientific discoveries and a much better understanding of what people are looking at. Um, yes, is there, are there any, um, any questions on that while we're um, setting up the demonstration? We, we've got a couple of questions. Uh, one you answered already, Dion, was about the use of photographs. Yes, um, look, the use of photographs is, is very common practice. And I would just add to what Dion said about photography versus drawing. Um, it's actually a very different process in terms of the way that the eye, hand and brain works in, in understanding and looking at a subject. When we take a photograph, those eye hand brain coordination responses don't happen and so the the memories and the embedding of that understanding is a very different process and so if you're wanting to really remember and understand something it's far better to actually draw it than it is to press a button on a camera and take a photograph but photographs are an essential tool for understanding subjects and i think as with any scientific um, experience, um, triangulating our sources and using a range of different sources is important, but the drawing process itself is what embeds those understandings in our memory. Dion, yeah, you sorry, Julie, there's, a, there's two more, and they're probably, uh, I suppose you could answer them in the same response, I suppose. Mm. So one came from Heather and she'd mentioned that it's hard to get people to sign up for class because I think it involves art. And she had to promise that they didn't have to draw. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I can relate to that. Yes, look, you know, it's a really interesting thing. We've now taught thousands of students. And one of the things that we need to really understand is that um, many, many children are are, are sort of told when they go through school, oh, you're not an artist. Um, and then that switches off people's um, willingness and confidence with drawing for the rest of their life, which is such a sad thing. I think one of the really important things to understand is that everyone can draw. And in nature journaling, it's not about art. It's about creating your own personal records of what you're looking at it certainly does not need to be a piece of artwork. It is more important that is actually noting the things that you're observing and understanding what you're looking at. So I would really strongly encourage people to have a go and, and use drawing as a way to understand. The more that you draw, the better your drawing becomes. And it's a matter of practice. Everyone can draw. Everyone can draw. And let me just add to that. That whole I can't draw scenario, if I had a, a dollar for every time somebody came to a class or a field trip or a workshop with that thought in their head, I'd be, I wouldn't, I'd, I'd be living on a desert island enjoying solitude. <laughs> I'd be wealthy as anything. Everybody thinks that. And, you know, I think the challenge is that on the internet today, we see the best of the best. And there's a lot of people who who I think post their very, very best work and indicate that it was probably just something they threw together, um, which is a sad misdemeanor because that's not true. Field art and working and drawing and sketching in the field is very different from sitting in a studio after years and years and years of education and practice. Um, and these beautiful revived, refined works come out. In nature generally, art is an important part of it, but not for everybody. And I think that's what's important to note is that with nature journaling, there are so many components and art is one of them. And in our ability to teach what we call rapid field sketching, which is an ability to capture something quickly and loosely so that you can capture the information associated with that. 
And so the first thing I say to my students is you don't, number one, you don't have to be able to draw because I'm going to teach you how to draw, but I'm going to teach you how to draw for the purposes of recording information and telling your story. Turning that into an, a, a beautiful piece of art to hang on the wall or a refined natural illustration used for publication is a completely different thing. And if, you know, we find a lot of people learn very, very quickly and that their, their drawings in their nature journals become amazingly accurate with a few simple techniques. So we try and encourage people not to be put off by the idea of art and drawing um, because secretly I think most people would really like that, you know, they really like it, that inner child is still there wanting to pick up the crayons and do really fun things with them. We find, because we teach a lot of um, school students, you know, young people and children from the very earliest of age, and they're the ones that come with the right mindset. And so what we do is we work very hard to capture the, the key elements of the children's mindset and bring that to adults and bring that to scientists and say, you know, there are stories that need to be told. They're important stories as part of science that need to be told and communicated and, you know, we can, through nature journaling, you can help people. You know, yeah, to... that's right. And, and, you know, it's all about curiosity and, and you know, using those prompts to um, ask questions about what you're seeing. Another very famous um, nature journaler was Beatrix Potter, who did a lot of studies on mycology and fungi in, in um in her nature journals and all of those things became really important to science later on. Um, it was so, you know, there are so many examples of people who've used nature journaling and little sketches, little field notes. Um, those observations are so important for science and, and for each and every person to have to take a, a make a contribution to science through their nature journaling and their observations with nature. You, you mentioned collecting information, Dion, and I don't know if this question is from someone who is aspiring to be a professional illustrator, but their question is, how is the information collected and shared? Well, it's collected through first-hand experience. Um, and, you know, it's about getting out in the field. Most importantly, you know, we find teaching people to slow down. We provide opportunities for people, providing opportunities for people to get out in nature with some guidance is really important because what we don't have is, there's not a lot of opportunity to learn how to be a naturalist, to learn how to study things. And so nature generally gives us that opportunity and citizen science gives us the experiences by getting involved in citizen science projects and then having those citizen science projects um, introduce nature journaling as part of the process, we're finding that that's getting people in, in the process of collecting data because co collection is about experience and observation. You've got to get out and you've got to look and you've got to look again before you can start recording. Now, transitioning to that to illustration becomes something that is I think more professional. Um, now we find a lot of people, once they learn the basics of nature journaling and specifically observation and field sketching, their journey towards illustration becomes more clear and more quick. And there's lots and lots of opportunities. I know Nature Art Lab, we teach a lot of professional level um, natural science illustration courses, but um, for illustrators, then it's about bringing specimens back and using photographic reference and field guide reference and scientific collaboration. For illustrators who are producing illustrations for scientific journals or publications, then the process of scientific collaboration with project leaders is really, really vital. And, you know, there's a whole mechanism of steps that we take for that and that's not what this is about this is about getting everyday people who love nature and want to get involved with more purpose um, and contribute something to the greater understanding and hopefully then to the greater advocacy of nature then nature journaling is a vehicle to help them do that and make the connection between citizen science participation 
and citizen science projects and then ultimately the data that comes out of that um, and the way that that data is then communicated back to those citizen science, um, to the citizens involved. So, yeah, hopefully, did I answer that question or did I? Yeah, <laughs> you got a follow-up <laughs> question, you did. Uh -huh. So uh, the, basically what they're saying is once you've made the observations and to create a broader learning, uh, what are the avenues for sharing the observations? And I think you sort of alluded to that in, in a way, but I, I suspect, I mean, this person's a researcher and they're pursuing this in, in their citizen science Sorry. research. So I think right. they're looking at what are the avenues rather than, you know, the process. Okay, well, the avenues are really important and they're still emerging because nature journaling as an important part of science, citizen science and scientific communication is emerging. So they're, they're coming up with new avenues all the time. And um, there is John Laws, again, going back to our American grandfather of nature general, or father, I should say, probably kicked me for saying grandfather because he's the same age as me. But um, he, he started the concept of the nature journal club, much like um, a naturalist club, where people get together and they go out in the field on a regular basis to explore nature and then share and journal. And a lot of that goes into his books. A lot of it goes into class teaching. The other ideal is to get um, a lot of our work attached to and as part of the scientific publication and communication and not just through the one or two or the handful of seasoned and immaculately skilled natural science illustrators, but the everyday people who are communicating those projects and experiences in the scientific journals and publications with an everyday take on those experiences. Um, now the museums, um, we want to encourage museums and universities to start collecting and gathering nature journals again as part of their collections for examination, for sharing and for education. Um, and the other component that Nature Art Lab have been discussed in developing is what we call the um, Nature Journal Project, where we are putting together a project to encourage participants to, we'll provide a journal, they take the journal, they take it out into nature, they fill the journal with their nature experiences, and then we bring it back into a library of Nature Journal collections, and then those journals go on tour, um, and they become part of our scientific record. So that's the nature journal part. The other side is that those nature journals become very personal and we find a lot of people want to get into nature journaling as a way to develop a legacy that they can then pass on to their families and their children and grandchildren. Um, one of the things that sparked this idea was that the number of students that come to me in classes and say, look what I found, my grandmother did this beautiful, my great grandmother did this beautiful painting of a bird and you know, it's passed down to me and it's so treasured and it's so important to that family legacy. And I know that you know, one of our, Julia Fiona, I think it is, is keeping yeah. She's a, a very, very credentialed botanical illustrator and a tutor with Nature Outlab, and she's keeping her nature journals, which are exquisite to look at, solely as a record of her time in nature to pass on to her grandchildren. So there's a personal, very personal element to it as well. I think um, just, to, just to add to that, I think also there's, a, there's actually a really important um, thing that uh, I guess it's a it's a new area of how to record how to um, introduce the findings from nature journaling into the scientific realm and I believe that there's this is it's a nascent area I believe that there's something that we can do to help to um, to engage scientists in the documentation that's been recorded in nature journals so I think it's a very, very good question and a very important area for us to follow up on and look at avenues to support that because there's a, a very important story to be told there, um, you know, through those observations over generations um, and looking at the differences between what's happened in past decades with what, what's happening now in different areas. 
Um, and I think, you know, you can go back in Australia to people like, um, I think Kevin McDonald um, in the Newcastle area was doing documentation of nature in his area. And if you look at what's happening there now, compared with what he journaled and documented in his area, you know, previously, we probably start to see some changes that could inform um, climate change um, variation studies and all sorts of things. So, you know, I think there's a very, very important role for nature journaling contributions to scientific research and study in the longer term. Uh, that's it for questions currently, Julia yeah. and Dion. Uh, I'm sure there'll be many more to come as we as we progress. Yes. Yeah, so okay. Yeah, so we may, we'll do a little um, live demonstration now with Dion. And um, let me change. Yes, we we're going to have a look at a um, at a at a very well known species, the little Christmas beetle, um, and Anaplagnathus species, probably. Um, so we're going to have a do a little demonstration of the typical nature journaling. Um, approach so the first thing to do is to really have a good look at this beetle before we start drawing understand how it's structured understand how the head and the thorax and the um, and the body segments work how are they attached how do they function as a whole for that beetle where are the wings attached on the beetle and we, we can turn, the, turn the, um, the beetle over and have a look at the underside of the body. Um, where are the legs attached on a beetle? Now, many people um, who, who would be drawing or looking at a beetle might actually think that the legs are coming out from all, from right down the, through the abdomen of the beetle. But if we turn that over, the beetle's legs are actually attached to the, the midsection of the body. And, um, and so these are some of the details that we can learn to observe and understand about this beetle. The other thing that we might ask is how many legs, how many um, segments are there to a beetle's leg? How, how do the, um, what do the beetle's claws look like? How does it hold on to, um, how does it hold on to the branches so securely when the wind's blowing in those trees? Um, what do the mouth parts of the beetle look like and what sort of food does the beetle eat? These are all the sorts of things that we can have a closer look at when we're doing our nature journaling and understanding the subject that we're looking at. I love and this beetle because it's, um, it's just the coloration is amazing. And it wasn't until I actually got it. Sorry, we've lost a few pieces of it because I've used it so many times for demonstration. Um, but once I got it, I don't know if you could see this. Yes. It's kind of hard to see because of the lighting in here, but there's this little segment in the middle. Yes, the little section in the middle where the elytra attach. Right. Well, that's covered in white hair. Yes. Which I didn't actually see until under the microscope. Um, yes. I've lost, I lost his claws. And the other thing that I noticed when I was examining it in, in a lot of detail was the iridescence on its um, thorax. Abdomen. Abdomen yeah. actually transitions to this beautiful little section. It's hard to see under the light. A beautiful little strip that runs right up its, its centre. Yeah. yeah, it's bright green. So I don't know how much of that you can see. And the um, other the other questions that we might start asking when we're looking at this beetle is um, all insects have really fascinating life cycles. So, you know, we could ask some questions here about, okay, what would the larva look like? What's the, um, what are the previous stages to the life cycle of this insect? Um, and those are those I need to questions that we're going to follow up later on and do that further research about to understand later on. So what we're going to start with doing is just getting the general shape and the, the size of the beetle documented on our page. And Dion's using um, a, a, a process sort of known as an, to map the size and the shape. And then we're going to draw the basic outline shapes of that beetle. 
we're going to also be able to record the measurements of that beetle. So Dion's got a fantastic little, um, little tool there to act accurately get the measurements of that beetle. So we know how big it is, what the width, what the length of the beetle is for a start. Then we can start doing the actual drawing of the beetle, understanding the overall shape and where the, where the different parts of the beetle um, join together and, and connect. So and I can do it, sorry, Julia, I can do it either life size or what I'm going to start by doing is some very quick sketching, just really loose, quick sketching at larger than life. Because in the initial sketching phase, especially when you're in the field, um, capturing the information becomes more important than a beautiful picture. Okay, That's the beautiful fine. pictures come in the studio. And so, you know, you, you, you're not going to see them um, initially. And so what I'm seeing here is a series of shapes, okay? So if I were to do the overall shape of the beetle, I'd start with a big oval, okay? But then to break it down, I've got a half oval here. And then I've got a half oval here and a half oval here and a square there. Now to bring that into an important record of information is just bringing those shapes, those quick sketching shapes, piece by piece. There's his center line. And then I've got half, half. Yeah, there's almost always symmetries involved with everything that we're looking at. So understanding the symmetry. So if you draw a center line, you can easily draw one half as well as the other and working out proportions of your subject. So work, you know, it's going to be a prox and you can use your measure to, to actually measure the thorax um, against the abdomen and the head and just make sure that those measurements are correct. Now those notes might be written in in, um, in written notes, numbers and words on your diagram, the actual diagram doesn't need to be exactly right. But what we're trying to do here is to record and observe those structures and the way that it all fits together and make any little notes as you're, as you're drawing about what you're noticing and what you're seeing here on this beetle. So Dion's writing in some information there about the elytra and the way that the, the space between the body, the thorax and the, the main um, abdomen of this little beetle, where the eyes are sitting on there and the little, um, the little head structures. And so I'm just getting a determination of where the eyes sit. Now, the thing is, I'm the perspective I've chosen initially is straight over the top of the beetle. Mm. But I still want to see how those eyes sit within, I don't, once I bring it up to the camera, the light, it gets harder to see. No, that doesn't blur. But the, the eyes are sitting, they're embedded yes. inside there. Just on so the right-hand side there, and they're quite well protected in that little head, head section. Yeah. Now, my little beetle has lost most of his claws and I lost two of them yesterday when I got him out <laughs> but he's just he's a demonstration specimen so he's not a, he's not a scientifically um a, a significant specimen um, so I'm drawing simple shapes and that's probably where his claw would have been so when you find, if you find dead insects, which we do find a lot in the field, um, it's really great to, once you have gotten the information about where you found it and what was going on, um, it's, I'm going to go a little bit closer, see if we can get a little bit closer so you can start to see what I'm doing. Um, it's good once you've done some research on a, a identification and also um, a little bit about it, you can understand that these there might be parts missing from your insects and I'm often finding dead insects and it's important to understand is there something missing from it and why would it be missing? I wonder why it's missing. I need to look it up and try and work out why it's missing. 
And so, so Dion, Dion, on your drawing there, you might make some um, little notes, for example, about the location of where this beetle was found. Um, that, those location notes are really important for um, future reference. So we need to know where the, where the beetle was found. We, it's also really interesting, as um, Dion mentioned earlier on, to record the bigger picture of, um, of the habitat. So we're talking about ecosystems. Where does this little beetle fit within an ecosystem? Was it found in dry forest? Was it found in a, um, in a, um, um, a forest area? Was it found in a grassland area? What kind of tree was it sitting on? Um, often you'll find that um, in entomology and many of the scientific disciplines, there's a tendency to focus on the specimen itself. With, with nature journaling, we can actually broaden that to actually look at what all the other details that we need to understand about that beetle. The other thing we might do is if we're looking closely at this beetle, we might also notice that it has, it's carrying little mites, um, for example, or it might be um, in, um, in association with some other species in the, in the area. Another question we might ask is, um, what sort of birds or what sort of pr um, predators does this beetle have? And you might notice when you're out in the field, what sorts of birds are interested in eating this beetle? Um, is it, so it's a food source for something else in the food chain. And these are the sorts of things that we should be observing and understanding when we're in the field as a nature journaler. So I'm just doing some color testing at the moment. Now, what I'm using here is this is just a little piece of magnetic whiteboard that you buy from an office shop, okay? And it's really, really good because I take it into the field with me and when I find something, I photograph it on the white in the field and then I can flip it over and it gives me a black side as well. And I photograph my subject on both in both of those environments. Um, and those photographs are important because it shows me, especially with things like flowers, butterflies, well, not so much butterflies, but flowers and leaves and, and all of those kinds of things, the, um, the colours can fade very quickly. And it's important to try and get a record of colour variations in different environments. Um, and then when I'm colour mixing, I sit my little insect on the whiteboard next to um, the page, and I can do some colour matching just by picking up some paints to try and get as accurate as I can. Now, the iridescence on this bug is so vivid that every, what I'm seeing in front of me right now, and I look at the screen and it's completely different than what you're seeing. Um, it's just really, really vivid. Let me see if I can lighten it a little bit. You know, there's lots and lots of colors in there. So I'm getting, what I'll do is get the main, under layers of color and sort of from where I'm sitting down towards here, I've got a lot more green. So I'm gonna, I'm color matching my green as close as possible. And it's just, it, you know, it really just becomes um, a personal ability to decide what colors work where. And it's just about playing around here and you can you know you can swatch them on the paper to see how they go but color notes it's not just about color um Dion are you able to pull your um screen up a wee bit just so we can see your color notes on the bottom of the page there yeah perfect oh, sorry yeah um the other thing you'll notice with Dion's what she's using there she's using what's called a watercolor a water pen this is a fantastic field um field um brush it's a plastic tube that you can refill with water screw on and then you've got your water and your brush all in one instrument it's absolutely fantastic for field notes and so you just clean it yeah clean it on there and a little and they actually squeeze the the um the handle of the brush to filter the water through the brush end to clean it and you can so you can use that to drop water on onto your surfaces or clean the brush and um, you've got a wonderful supply of water for the whole um, field trip. The other um, medium that you can use is coloured pencils. 
Um, you can use um, marker pens. You can use graphite pencils and just do graphite drawings in black and white. Um, but doing colour notes is a really nice idea in the field and just getting a bit of an understanding of what that beetle looks like. Um, the other thing that you'll notice with the beetle, um, it has a little part of its wings coming out at the base of the, of the elytra there. Um, an interesting thing about beetles, as everyone knows, they have a set of transparent wings underneath those elytra covers. And so when we're doing our drawing of the beetle, um, we can make the little elytra uh, the wings that are coming out at the bottom. Um, sometimes you might find the elytra open on a beetle as they, as they fly, they lift those elytra up, the hard covers of the wings up, and the underneath of that are the two other transparent wings that it flies with. Um, so they're just fascinating little things. And um, there's so much to learn about beetles and, and the way that they work. So my hands are shaking a lot, so it's kind of messy, and I knew that would be the case. But, you know, here's the important thing. It's a field sketch, okay? It's not a work of art that's going to go on a wall. Um, it's, it's designed for information. And so what, what I've done, and I can show you, I, did, I worked on this yesterday as well, um, but I make colour notes. Mm. And then I can start to say things like, you know, primary visual, and then I notice with this particular bug, when under the different lights as I move around, there's a lot of warmth in there. So what I've got is the underlying um, translucency, but then I've got an overlying neutral. So it's a series of browns and various kind of colours in the neutral palette that come out over the top of it. And so what I might do then is make dominant colour notes about, um, this is what I call the skin colour. And these are what I call the underlying um, iridescence. So iridescence um, is really, really difficult to catch colour wise, but it's also the most fun. So if you find really colourful butterflies and beetles, and I find a lot of my students absolutely love it when we get to the colour swatching component because it really is about trying to describe not just the parts of the beetle or the parts of your subject, but how, how, is, how it's presented, what's its, what's its display um, in, all, in all the different ways. So when I bring it underneath, the abdomen at the very bottom here is a really beautiful combination of dark greens and blues. And so if I want to do what we call a zoom in, zoom out, so I'll flip it over and I'll show you the flip over one I did yesterday. This is, I was just practicing, okay? So I did multiple perspectives and it's, it's really what we call step five, I think, correct, Julia, of the process. Yes, that's right. So, and, and showing, the, showing the different sides of the drawing. So once we've done our initial drawing, the really important thing with nature journaling is to look at it from different perspectives. So look at the side view, look at the underneath view, show where the legs are joining on that beetle, show what it looks like from the front, from the back, and it's really understanding that insect to a great level of detail that you wouldn't be able to do if you were just taking a photograph of it. Right. And, you know, I spent quite a lot of time observing the underside. And I think one of the things that I really noticed was the difference in colour, even under strong light, between the underside of the abdomen and this tail part. It was almost purpley and blue. And there was all these other colours emerging from it. And then the colour dulled a little bit up here. And this was purely and simply because I was looking at colour. My purpose at this moment was to look at the colour. And I realised under the microscope that what I was looking at here was fine hair, even underneath. And then underneath here, underneath the mouth, was fine hair. And so because most of his claws and his legs had, or her, I don't know if in, in entomologists among you can identify it as a male or a female, um, they've broken off. 
Um, right, generally, I would, what yeah, is generally, it? Generally, the males are smaller and the females are much bigger. So <laughs> I don't have anything to compare it to. <laughs> so, yeah, so that's another thing. If you had several Christmas beetles, you could actually then do a comparative study to look at the size differences between the different beetles. Um, but yes, Dion, what you're saying is one of the wonderful things that you also can do with nature journaling, which is very different from a photograph, is to actually study the textures, textural surfaces that you're looking at. So it's not just a shiny beetle. When you look more closely at it, you can see lots of little hairs, lots of little claws. You can see, um, um, you know, all sorts of different textures, little holes and pits on the surface of the beetles. Um, thorax. Um, there's so much to discover on just on the surface of one little beetle. Right. And, you know, I mean, for those of you who think, oh my gosh, you know, the whole drawing thing is just really challenging. I, I, I just want to show you because that's, that's the beetle and I knew I would either have shaky hands or run out of time to do it justice because one of the joys of nature journaling is to sit in nature and spend some beautiful quality time between you and your subject and it becomes a relationship, your relationship with what you're seeing in nature and that your journal is your record of that unique relationship. Um, so, you know, that's just a quick one. But for me, my process is I have two main journals, two, two main things. And one of them is, you know, I keep, let me just zoom out so you can get a better view of it. Um, but this is my field journal. So this is what I take with me in the field. And it's, it's really, there's a lot of notes. Let me just make it a bit darker so you can see it a bit more. Um, and these are the sketches, as you can see, they're very rough, habitat sketch. I, I keep maps um, of this little tick was on me. He didn't penetrate <laughs> though, thank God. I caught him in time. Um, so, you know, there's, this is a, just a record of finds and citizen science projects I've been involved with. Here's another way to explore colour, um, especially with things like sunsets. And I've got a, a lovely one. Oh, I know where it is, of, of a sunset I saw while in a, on a field trip. And I, I, I was so quick, I didn't have time to draw the whole scene. And, but the sky was what fascinated me in that moment. And so I did just a series of colour blends to indicate what it was. Um, as far as metadata is concerned, you know, and they're not all good. This is the Kalula Bioblitz. We did habitats. This is a, um, what we call a 3D uh, geology block. Um, lots and lots of interesting, this was fascinating and this became something for science. I was in the Tawantan National Forest in Noosa, just where I live, um, just in a park just outside of town. And I was studying mosses and, and fungi on near and on a tree. And as I was sitting so quietly sketching, I was doing, you know, I was observing and sketching this beautiful vibrant green looked like a fungus or a moss on the tree. And as I was sitting there quietly, I was so quiet, this beautiful, huge dingo walked right up, a wild one, by the way, walked right up beside me. It didn't even bat an eyelid at me and just took a look at me and then walked on. And I didn't want to ruin the moment by trying to hustle for my phone to get a photograph and blah 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 <laughs> and because I had my book out I just was I started sketching what I was seeing and then I fit you know he disappeared before I had a chance to finish him off which is why his face looks really funky but then I, I contacted the Noosa Shire Council and and said look I just had an experience with a dingo in a part of the forest that there's not supposed to be any dingoes in and they said Oh no, there's no dingoes there. No, I said, you need to put me onto somebody because I've got a record of a dingo. And I was able to get the GPS locations of exactly where the dingo passed by. Um, I had metadata up here on the uh, weather conditions, moon conditions, um, clouds, geographic location, the exact time I saw the dingo. And they, they took copies of my page. They wanted copies of all of these pages so that they could, and I described it. I described the experience I had. 
um, I said the head. I didn't realise it was a dingo initially because there was, I know there was wild dogs there and I thought the colour looked like a dingo, but for some reason I got it in my head that this tail wasn't a dingo. And it wasn't until I did research and looked it up that that is a unique part of the dingo is the fluffy tail that sits above its body when it's relaxed. And so I described it all. And I actually said somewhere in here, I don't think it was a dingo, I think it was a wild dog. And then I realised it was a dingo. And so, you know, there's legitimacy to that. And so now they know that they have at least one wild dingo in the field. That's really wonderful, Dion. And, and um, so as you can see, this is Dion's In the Field Nature Journal with all her notes, all of her, um, this, the information that makes this a very important scientific record. And it's not about creating artwork, it's those observations and understanding and connections with nature that are so important. Right, and, and this, is some, this is what I call the base camp journal. So this is something I then do when I want to refine them. Um, and see, I, that's when I found this little guy. Ah, oh, beautiful. Yeah. Um, and so, you know, these become, if I wanted to study, I was doing a study with um, people on seeds. Um, and so we found, we were documenting seed pods and this one, we know it's a flame tree, but at the time we didn't. And it wasn't until I started sketching it that because as an illustrator, you have to make sense of what you're seeing, that I discovered there were two tiny, tiny, tiny little flame tree seeds in here, one in here and then one under here because they were bright yellow. And we had to look at it under the microscope. And I've now got two flame trees growing in my backyard. <laughs> Dion, we're up to um, quarter to 12, so we might need to um, continue with the next part of our presentation. Definitely. So that's just some... Okay. That's great. <laughs> Let me do a screen share again. I'll get you back here. Okay. <clears throat> so this really just talks about what we've already discussed, I think, in, in a more important way. This really looks at the foundation to citizen science participation. And I think that the key to citizen science success is that you have people involved, people actually getting out and being involved in the projects and doing their part to contribute to the knowledge databases of natural sciences but keeping people doing it, getting them to continue doing it over and over again and to actively seek opportunities with citizen science to, um, to be a part of it means they need something personally back from it, apart from building this huge record in iNaturalist. To have a record of their own experience is, I think, one of the keys to keeping people involved, to give them opportunities to nature journal along with contributing to citizen science. Um, so it's an ongoing practice. It's not a one-off. Generally, the journals become important once they're, they've started to build weight. Um, and it's a very important opportunity for education. We use it a lot in um, Peter 12 environmental scientific and artistic education and and through nature art lab we work with kids right from the very preppies right through to senior year 11 and 12 because nature journaling becomes important to the different aspects um, and it also enables a whole new generation of, of naturalists and scientists to you know number one pass on their knowledge and experience and importantly their stories um, but to create these legacies of journals that can be examined by whoever needs to examine them, displayed for public um, consumption per se, um, and used to communicate the ideals of field research and observations and findings. Um, and so they contribute to the scientific resources in a way that straight science, you know, probably lacks. Okay, so how do we encourage nature journaling as a key part of citizen science because this is all great but how do you actually get people to do it how do you get people 
to bring a journal along to a program of some sort. And the bottom line to that is very simple. We need to teach participants to observe more deeply. We need to give participants the opportunity to learn, to add nature journaling to their citizen science involvement um, and, you know, helping them maximise their own personal experience in the citizen science project. Because loading photos up to iNaturalist is, is a really important and very great way for people to contribute but it becomes very one way, I think, for a lot of people, not for everybody. Certainly, there are a lot of photographers and scientists who don't want to know about nature journaling, and that's totally fine, but there's a lot of people who do. Um, so it enriches their experience. So our proposal is that citizen science provides much more opportunity for their participants to learn the skills of a nature journaler. And then to take those skills, either learn them while they're engaged in ASCA projects or take those skills into ASCA projects and create a whole new dimension of data collection. Um, and, you know, for people then to be able to build on and on and on their nature journals through different projects and different experiences, it keeps them involved, it keeps them coming back. Um, so in our minds, it's up to citizen science project organisers to provide nature journaling education. Um, and that's through companies like Nature Art Lab and others. Um, and give, them, give their participants the opportunity to develop a purpose of their own, not just adopting the purpose of the project. Um, this photo is of some, a lovely group of homeschoolers uh, senior level homeschoolers that I worked with for a semester and it was 100% nature journaling and it was absolutely fabulous and while all of the classes that we teach in nature journaling take place outdoors they don't take place in a classroom they take place you know sometimes with some of the programs we might do week one in a classroom so that they get the basic skills in a classroom setting but for 99% of the programs they're outdoors in the field and rain, hail or shine, we learn to deal with it all because that's what field science is. Um, Julia, did you want to talk to this one? Um, yeah, these are just a couple of flyers for some of our upcoming um, nature journaling and foundation studies that will be offered in Noosa. Um, we also have a range of similar courses on offer in, in the ACT for those on in the southern part of Australia. Um, and so we welcome anyone to come along and join these courses just um, to develop your foundation skills and really um, build that confidence and understanding with the, the potential that nature journaling has and, and also building, giving people the opportunity to learn the basic drawing skills and watercolour skills to use in their nature journals as they go forward. But it's... Um, what we found from many of the courses that we've delivered over the last four years in Canberra, um, nature journaling is life changing. It's actually, um, it actually changes your perspective on the world around you and your role within that world. Um, it's an incredibly inspiring and satisfying um, pursuit to undertake and um, and so many people um, have started nature journals. And once you learn to see with nature journaling um, approaches, um, I, I think uh, you'll, never, you'll never step out into nature again the same way. It's, um, it's absolutely so rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so it's a powerful addition to so many citizen science events and environmental education programs. And, you know, we know firsthand uh, the Kalula Coast Bio Blitz, which takes, took place earlier this year, um, for the very first time um, brought nature journaling into the mainstream. And it's a very, very popular and um, very lucrative in terms of its findings. It, um, program, the BioBlitz. Um, and so we had a, a team of people who signed up for the Nature Journaling stream. Um, and we, throughout the BioBlitz, we ran a series of workshops and we took the journalers out in the field for specific nature journaling programs. Many of them got involved in the scientific field programs because it's literally 18 hours over a day, over three days of intense biodiversity study through 
some world-class scientists leading field research. And so the journalists all distributed and went on those programs and many of them stayed for the entire program with the Nature Journal group. And we did large scale habitats on one of the days. And then we did, so we did coastal heath and the sand blow. We did uh, wallum and we did rainforest as well as creek. And so during that one day, we did the three habitats and people were able to explore those habitats and document their experiences in those habitats. And then on day two, we did what we call the one metre square project, which is a really great one. We use this a lot with kids where we block out one metre squared, you know, all, you know, we might have 15 grids depending on how many people are involved and each journal has their own grid of one metre square and they have to observe and document through both words and pictures and data and whatever they possibly can, the components of that one metre. Dion, we're, we're about two minutes out now, so I think we've only got a couple more slides. And that's here we go. That's awesome. <laughs> yeah. So that's, you know, that's, that's an important way to get involved. Um, so, yeah, hail to the BioBlitzers. They're, they're a great experience. That's it from me. Thank you. Any more questions before we wrap up? I think just a, a couple of general ones, Julia. One was about the tool that you use for measuring the beetle, Dion, and someone suggested it's a multifunctional geometric ruler, bit of a yep. mouthful, uh, <laughs> and the pens. So are they readily available? Yes, they are. The little, the little um, water pens, water brushes are available just about anywhere at um, any of the art stores around Australia. Possibly news agents also stock them, so you can get those just about anywhere. Yeah, they're, they're pretty good. Mm -hmm. yeah. And a magnifying glass is very important. Yeah, yeah so Dion, where did the little, um, the little ruler come from? That looks fantastic. Hey. Uh. Yeah, it is. Um, I got that, I, I must admit, I just bought it online. And I can, I'd be very happy to share the link because I bought two of them. I saw them online. Yeah. And it's brilliant. It's perfect for the field because I can do, um, I, I can do compass bearing measurements and I can do, oh, very also. Nice. Compass, yeah. Very nice. It is. It's great. And it fits in a little, um, a little pencil case, which is basically the thing about nature journaling. You only need a very small pencil case or box that you can put in a little backpack or a side satchel and you've got everything in there. Nature journal, one little box with all your gear set out and that's it and off you go and take it with you anywhere you are in nature. Yep. Even we're, in the backyard. <laughs> sorry, Julie, we're about to get the cut, I yeah. think. So on behalf of AXA, uh, I would <laughs> like to thank the Perry for a, a, a wonderful presentation. Lots and lots of <laughs> questions and positive comments. And I'm sure you'll be getting lots of follow-up emails and contact from the people that have attended today's session. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you everybody for participating. Yes, thanks everybody. I appreciate the opportunity. Thanks, Julia. You're most welcome. But and um, yeah, we'd welcome any any questions. Contact us at um, at Nature Art Lab. We'd be more than happy to help. Bye, everyone. Bye.